And this failure is visible in what we call the Mediterranean conundrum, which we're going to discuss today. And if we try to map the countries that are currently coming together in a friendlier or non-friendly way, in Syria we have a very long list. I try to map some of them. We start by Iran, the Gulf states, Russia as of recently, the US, then we have Iraq. If we think of the bigger terms of the refugee crisis, we have of course the countries that are so-called transit countries, which brings us closer to Europe, namely Western Balkans. Then again, countries where people are fleeing for their lives which are Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan. We also have kind of Israel, and we have Assad still in Syria. We have something which we call Daesh slash ISIS slash ISIL. And at the end of this chain, we have still the Syrian people. And I've been told that this is the panel with one of the smartest people here, so I want to challenge you. I want to have, in the next one, one and a half hours, um, scenarios. And I know that the court has been very critical when it comes to um, salvaging Syria. Very, not critical, but very pessimistic, to put it in the right words. Um, I would like to kick off with you, Dan, and then s ask you the question, can we salvage Syria? If not, why? And what is a future scenario for Syria, assuming that some of the actors who are intervening there would change their um, behavior. I was kind of optimistic about the possibilities of Syria until three weeks ago. Um, I mean, just to wrap up, what is Syria? Um, Syria was a, a revolt against Assad that was repressed in a very, very violent way. Uh, people started to organize themselves uh, militarily in order to defend their own citizens um, and that is a start of the civil war uh, of the let's say the citizens were defected soldiers against the army of Assad we didn't support uh, these citizens we didn't support these rebels these armed rebels and by not supporting these armed rebels we created the space for two forces of course we made Assad stronger, and secondly, we created a space for the Islamic extremists. I was absolutely in favor for a no-fly zone from the very beginning. Why? Because the army of Assad does not want to die for Assad. So they don't want to fight on the ground. So what did they do? They were having airplanes bombing people everywhere. I was inside Syria, I mean, I have been sleeping between the barrel bombs, uh, very happy that I survived. Um, they were flying really everywhere around. So the idea of a no-fly zone, as well as giving arms, uh, anti-aircraft arms to the rebels, was exactly the idea of stopping these planes. From the moment these planes stop, Assad's army is just going to collapse. He still had these planes, and right now it was clear it was still collapsing. Again, because his army does not want to fight. Iran had taken over everything of uh, Assad's army. Uh, already two years ago, they took over the three security services. Now they took over the army and so forth. And still, Assad was falling down, despite the, the support of Hezbollah uh, and just Iran. So now Russia came in. We had the reasons before. Uh, because Russia wants, uh, is a spoiler, they don't want to solve a problem, they don't want to fight ISIS, no, they want to keep Assad in place and create a vassal state. So why am I pessimistic? Because um, I see that the West has done nothing in Syria so far, nothing substantially, substantial, and now that Russia is there, I mean, when we have seen Russia going in into other frozen conflicts, I mean, talking about Ukraine and so forth, uh, uh, Georgia, we have not reacted. So what are we going to do now? We are certainly not going to react because we do not want to go into war with Russia. So Russia is there and I see no solution anymore. The only thing that is possible, no, there are two things, let's say, that would be possible, and that's you make one major 
huge worldwide conference with the, the five uh, 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 um, permanent members of the Security Council and talk it through. But then again, Russia is not honest about its, uh, its, its what it wants. And secondly, is that we do say, okay, we're going to install together with Turkey this no-fly zone in the north, which is a confrontation. The only way to stop Russia in moving forward and, 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 and trying to spoil countries uh, uh, everywhere where there's a revolution. Um, but I, I, sus I suspect we're not going to do this. So that's why I think that Syria, with a free and democratic and united future, is a lost cause. We will see at least three or four Syrias. And, uh, well, I'm currently very sad about that. And speaking of a no-fly zone, apparently the, you know, the, the European Union alone on its own wouldn't have done or would not do something like this, so we need the United States for this. After UNGA, Putin went to talk to Obama. Um, what did the two talk about? I mean... Uh, but I, could, I think you did a good segue of how Syria happened, but if I, if I would, I don't want to take, take it too far to the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, but I think we need to do that, one, uh, historically, what Syria is. And here, I make it a little personal. Actually, my family went to Syria as refugees. The very first Tarzi is buried in Damascus, and, and I have family from Aleppo, uh, a city that once was there. Uh, and uh, so my first time as a refugee was in what is today Syria, which then was Ottoman Empire. Uh, so I'm not saying this in a, in a but Syria was a creation of a state structure that was very alien. And I think one thing we need to know in solving a crisis like Syria is to look at the historical vacuum of post-Ottoman, what we call core Middle East right now. That structure is unraveling before our eyes. And you said correctly that the space created, filled by ISIL, whether it's ISIL, whether it is this sectarianism that is coming up, it is filling a, a situation that started in the post-Ottoman reality, which initially was being addressed with what I call Islamism. Islamism meaning anybody, any party, violent or not, not violent, that uses Islam as a political means. Initially, it was ideas on how to fill this space, and it was very peaceful. Then it started into political parties in the 20s, mainly in Egypt. And it morphed, and I don't have time to go through all of it, maybe in q and I'll tell you even the structure, but eventually you have what I call it Islamism 3.0. So I have from 1.1 all the way to 3.0, which is ISIS. And ISIS, I think, by the fact that they call themselves in Arabic, a Dawl al-Islamiyah, Islamic State, not al khalaf al-Islamiyah, an Islamic caliphate, they are challenging the very core of what we in the West hold to be the truth, which is the state model that European and then later on US was set upon. I think it is being challenged, and I think the fact Russia is in there is making this whole issue even more challenging and perhaps more dangerous. It is not just an issue of Syria as a country, it's an issue of an order by which we, all of us, whether NGOs, governments, academics, we all see the world through that lens. That is being challenged. That's important. Secondly, is something that is out of European hands. Again, I personalize where my, I was born in a city not far from here north uh, in Czechoslovakia. What Europe is feeling, this idea of, of, of refugees, for example. Again, answering this, there's no resolution to it until you understand it from an Islamic perspective. Islam is going through an evolution. And that evolution is not going to be fixed. I know I work in a, in, in a place where we try to fix everything. It's not going to be fixed. It has to be evolved. And European, American, foreign hands therein will actually damage this process, but this process is not even started yet. The process had to stop, start within sessions like this, but among <coughs> Muslims, talking about what the future of their own religion is. I don't know if the organizers know it or not, but right there, there's a mohr, a seal. You know what it says in the middle of it? A name, Fatima. Who is Fatima? Fatima was the daughter of the Islamic prophet Muhammad. 
until the Muslims decide who she was, meaning was she the birth giver of this divine line that the Shias follow, or was she just a person who just died? That division right now is in Syria. That division ha was there. The, you're right that the, 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 the activity started it, but why, you know, there's a lot of revolutions. The violence you see there, the holes you see there show that the structure as such was so weak that it unraveled like a, like a house of cards. Because if there was a structure, an identity about this country, I don't think you would have seen this. Which, in my view, where I agree is also the fact that Russia is in there. I think Russia is playing a much bigger game. And this game could actually put the Middle East, or at least specifically Syria, as maybe even a, st a new start of a Cold War type where we don't even know what the end game is. Whereas in the, the first Cold War, we had a game. I mean, it could have been disastrous, the mad theory, the mutually assured destruction, but there was an end goal. Here we don't even know what victory looks like. Let us all imagine victory in Syria. Right now, if I say that, I don't think we can even imagine the victory in Syria. And that is a dangerous thing. We, we cannot even imagine what a Syria post, I won't even say post Assad because he has now a guarantor in, in Moscow, but a post-conflict Syria looks like. When we can't even imagine that, that's, that's very dangerous. So I think when you look at Syria, also, we had another panelist who just walked away. When the Middle East is not Europe anymore, that space that Europeans created, the space to, you can have conflicts, you can have disagreements, but you can do it in a civil way. You can recognize each other's space. That doesn't exist in the Middle East. The fact that our speaker walked away tells you that the situation in Syria has much more deeper ideological underpinnings than we see in the West. We see it as a short-term, perhaps even election-based, year, two-year, three-year processes. I see this as generational. And this doesn't fit our system of governance, whether it's parliamentary or presidential. And this, again, is a second dilemma. And I use dilemma here in the Greek sense of the word. Two choices, none of which are good. So I wish I was more optimistic. I'm not, I'm, and I try to be, because Middle East is part of me. I work with the US government. I'm Czech-born, and I have roots in that part of the world. What happens there will have a direct impact on my future as a human being. But yet, all I can say is I quote a communist, which I don't like, so I escaped communist twice in my life. But I quote Gramsci, I say that I'm a pessimist because of my intellect and an optimist because of my will. Thank you. Um, Ambassador Iran. I mean, mentioned just that Russia is making it even more challenging and more complicated, and I don't think there is any doubt um, over here. Few people are talking that um, Russia is f kind of justifying its intervention in Syria um, as being on yet another Christian mission out there. How supportive is Israel of Russia's action in Syria, and why? I have uh, one uh, sort of general comment. What we see today in uh, Syria is something in common for another six Arab states. Basically, what you see is the internal disintegration of the states as we knew them. It's Syria, Libya, Somalia, Yemen, in a way, Lebanon, two Palestines, one in Gaza, one in the West Bank, uh, and, uh, of course, Syria itself. What you also see is the fact that the borders of these states remain intact. Uh, next year we will celebrate 100 years to the agreement between France and uh, Britain. By the way, there was a Russian diplomat involved in this, but everyone forgets this was about the remains of the Ottoman Empire and uh, Russia was interested in what happens in the Black Sea. Uh, but everyone rem remembers this agreement as the Sykes-Picot Agreement. The Sykes-Picot, in terms of the border, remains invalid, uh, in intact. And so I think that uh, it's, a, it's beyond Syria, number one. Number two, uh, 
we are in Israel, we are in a way ambivalent about the Russian involvement. Uh, uh, and I admit this. Once, uh, to begin with, Russia was involved in Syria ever, ever since the mid 50s uh, with Russian military assistance to uh, Syria, which we met on the battlefield at least twice once in uh, 67 and once in 73. Uh, but that in itself did not prevent the development of the Israeli-Russian relation. Only last week there was a Russian, the deputy chief of the uh, military, uh, the chief of staff in Israel, and we established what you call uh, uh, a hotline to prevent uh, an unintentional uh, confrontation between Israeli planes uh, which fly over parts of, East, of Syria and Russian planes and etc. Uh, so do we recognize the uh, Russian base, naval base in Latakia, no, uh, which is on the Mediterranean coast? No, we don't, but it's a fact of life. And we lived uh, with this for, as I said, ever since the mid-50s. Uh, we uh, have told the Russians uh, what worries us, uh, and I think that they take it into consideration. Fact is that the Russians avoided selling certain weapons to, uh, to Syria. Uh, and so there is a sort of uh, modus vivendi, if you want to call it, between uh, Israel and Russia uh, when it comes to not only, not only Syria, but among Probably now it is the number one uh, on the agenda. The question, of course, will uh, take a different direction when we come to discuss, or when the internet, international community uh, starts to deal with the future solution of, uh, of uh, Syria. Now, I basically agree with my two colleagues on the panel, uh, and I can compound the pessimism. But there is, uh, there is a way, uh, in fact, there is what, is what I call the Iraqi model. The Iraqi model basically is saying, yes, there was a central government in Baghdad. Yes, there was one central ruler uh, that everyone, uh, who everyone wants to forget because he was a butcher uh, from Baghdad. And he maintained the integrity of uh, Iraq only by terror. Uh, Syria, uh, today, Iraq is basically a confederation uh, by agreement, by the by all de facto uh, situation. There is a central government in Baghdad. There is a government which is everything uh, uh, as a state but by name. Uh, and there is the south which is uh, somewhat the wild west or the wild south of uh, of Iraq, controlled by the government, co controlled by the Iranians. Uh, it's a mixture. And it's, is it a perfect situation? No. Is it livable? Yes. Uh, people don't like it. People run away uh, in numbers. Uh, but it is manageable, put it this way. ISIS, of course, complicates the, the picture, but the, Iraqis themselves can live with this de facto situation. Syria will have to follow the model. It's not going to go back. And the question, of course, when you, ask, when you go back to your question about Russia, is uh, Russia going to take or to accept it and uh, basically condone it, either by being a participant in an international conference which will enshrine this agreement or uh, any other way. Russians are interested, interested not so much in Bashar Assad in my view. They are interested in the base, the, the naval base they have on the Mediterranean, uh, on the Syrian shore. If this is accepted 
in the context of the future agreement, that the Russian will go, Russians will go along with all that. So what needs to happen in order for the UN to step up and to have a proper role in this? Um, what do we need to do? Uh, I, I, I don't think that the UN is a player in this respect. It's a local, regional uh, conflict or dimensions uh, in the Syrian conflict, and it's uh, becoming uh, the conflict of the old superpower rivalry, the US and, uh, and Russia. Uh, it reminds me of Spain in the 30s of the previous century, uh, which is not a very promising situation because we all know what followed uh, the war in Spain. Not only the Second World War, but the years of uh, uh, the Franco regime. Uh, it doesn't have to, go to, to be that, uh, to follow this precedent, but it's not because the UN will have uh, some sort of influence. Uh, it may be the umbrella under which an arrangement can be reached, but basically it is uh, a couple of internal agreements between the regionals, which includes Israel to, extent, to a large extent, Turkey to a very large extent, uh, Iran, a major player there, and then an agreement between the two former superpowers or current superpowers, no matter how you call them, uh, the United States uh, and uh, Russia, and to some extent the European Union, because eventually any political agreement will have to be accompanied by some sort of an economic package. Uh, Syria is devastated. It wasn't a big economic success to be diplomatic about the situation before 2011. Uh, I don't follow necessarily what Tom Friedman from the New York Times says. He says that the civil war started because of the shortage of water. And he, uh, he, he's serious about it. He goes with the maps and the, the data, the statistics. Uh, there is a point there, uh, but I think that if you, even if you follow him or you don't follow what Tom Friedman said, there is a need for economic rehabilitation of Syria and indeed of the, the whole region. Thank you. You said basically, I mean following on what the ambassador just said, that it's a grand clash of Russia and US in Syria. And you have in mind the unwillingness of um, the U.S. to do a no-fly zone, what does that mean? I don't think the U.N. has... Uh, yes, on the refugee issue, they're very effective. Uh, they should be. On the political solution, I'm not saying we should not try to use them, but I think their effectiveness is, if at anything, very limited because it is a Syria, but regional and then trans-regional issue. You have to understand that it is a quasi... I mean, an indirect conflict between Iran and Saudi Arabia, and that's where I pointed to Fatima. That one is, is long. For Turkey, and this is something that most people forget, for Turkey, still, is ISIS a, a threat? Yes, it is. You just saw what happened in, in Ankara. Uh, but I would say a Kurdish entity, a Kurdish political entity which Ankara does not have say at, they're okay with, with, with the one in Iraq because that is very close to Ankara, the KRG, the Kurdish regional government. However, a Kurdistan or a Kurdish autonomous government in, in Syria, I think is unacceptable for Ankara because it has a territorial threat to Turkey's republic as a whole. So when you look at this, the conflict for Turkey comes in a point where it's, while ISIS is bad, it is becoming worse, still a Kurdish entity which a no-fly zone may actually support is unacceptable. People, when they follow the no-fly zone, it has to have Turkey's acquiescence. If not, and NATO cannot do it because Turkey will not accept it if that supports the Kurds. For Iran, I think Iran tries to, number one, keep this issue as becoming a sectarian issue. Rather, it looks at it more as a terrorism, anti-terror. 
whereas from the Saudi perspective, it is a sectarian issue. And the sectarianism right now has gotten to a point that, and this is why I kind of say 3.0, because I, sectarianism has become an identity of current Islamists. And that, usually sectarian wars are the hardest to solve correctly from outside, whether it be UN or countries, unless the regional supporters of these groups stop. And that's not only not stopping, it's actually escalating. So you have Saudi, for Saudi Arabia as well, do Saudis like ISIL? No. But, and I use this very, very carefully, I, I would look at countries such as Saudi Arabia's relationship with ISIL as, I'll, I'm not a medical doctor, but I'll use a medical terminology, as something akin to a terminal cancer and chemotherapy. What do I say? A, 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 a person who's well will not go to a doctor and say, doctor, give me chemotherapy. Chemotherapy could actually kill you, could make you very, very ill in itself. Why you go to chemotherapy? Because chemotherapy is a last resort to a terminal cancer. For Saudi Arabia right now, Iran, especially after the nuclear deal, with Russia's support, is terminal cancer. Whether this is correct or not, in their assessment, there's a Shia encirclement of the Saudi state, and they see that, they see the American kind of acquiescing Iran's regional role, uh, believe it or not, the Saudis may have one ally, and that's Israel, which is very ironic, but that's what they look at. They see themselves very, very threatened. Yes, they have a very good relationship with, with Washington, but it is a relationship which, is, which is, is losing trust. And therefore, they look at Iran's hand in Syria very, very dangerously. So therefore, they have a, they have a, they have a, uh, they have a problem with that. Uh, and, and Lastly, of course, you have the U.S.-Russia, which is my, which is your point. We are only supplying, the United States is only supplying right now tow missiles, but there's a lot of them, and Saudis are buying a whole bunch of tow missiles. So, so far, it's a ground issue. It may hit Russian tanks. That's, that's manageable. What it would not be manageable if someone, I don't think the U.S. would do it, but someone gives any of the rebels a SAM, a surface-to-air missile, and now imagine the scenario where Russian jets are shot down. Doesn't matter who gives this. Doesn't matter. Then you have a, a potential of a quasi-conflict, or if Russia is more emboldened and starts doing more and in, flies into the Turkish territory. Bad weather, we don't, how many times do you have bad weather? Uh, so all of this, I think we are raising the ante to a point that, that I think is, 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 is what I am afraid of strategically is an unintended, not intentional, an unintentional escalation of the conflict where it brings in the big powers or a couple of the regional powers into a situation where it may become unmanageable or at least goes out of, out of hand. In this case, I think, this is one place I disagree on the Iraq model. I think in Iraq, the outside hands, you didn't have the Russians in as much as you have them in Syria, and I think there was an understanding from the, after the fall of Saddam where, how, how much you can push. The Saudis, while they didn't like what was going on, they were still not doing what they're doing in Syria. I think Syria may become more dangerous. That's, that's what I, I just want to leave a word of caution. Uh, please, feel free to um, ask at least one question. I cannot imagine that no one's curious. Sinan, please. Now, there is an atmosphere of alarm within the EU. I'm talking on the refugee side. Um, we see, we saw in the last couple of weeks, uh, minister after minister visiting Ankara, uh, meetings after meetings in Brussels, now the summit and so on. Um, you have, you know, before you moved to Egypt, you've had some experience with European politics. So I just want to push you as to where do you see Europe, the EU, in other words, uh, within a year from now, in terms of what will, have, will it have achieved in managing the refugee crisis? Do you think it, that the trend is in the you know, right direction in terms of building more solidarity, more cohesion, uh, more cooperation within and with countries like Turkey? Or do you see this as a real threat to the cohesion of the Union 
at, at some point it's going to splinter uh, and collapse. I think they will handle the refugee crisis that, like they handled the financial and economic crisis, which means every measure will just be too little too late. So they will act now like say, okay, we will have that amount of refugees, we're going to force some countries into some quota. So uh, I was, by the way, surprised to hear the uh, representative from Romania saying that 10,000 would be a real problem. I mean, uh, if they had the percentage of, uh, of the, Turkish re the refugees in Turkey, it would have been one million in Romania. So anyway, um, so I think they will, it is going to be much bigger than we all expect. And one, for example, one solution we're talking about is already four years, but nothing is doing anything, is a temporary refugee status, like we did for Kosovo. I mean, we say, okay, we let them in. They can be here until we st the, the war is ended and we can start some reconstruction. I mean, it's just one scenario. So, but so far there's no thinking ahead. So I just think that we will do and react always a bit too late and too little but I don't think this will cause the end of the EU. No, I don't think it will be the end. I don't, I don't think so, no. Uh, I, they, they will keep on doing it and trying it, but they will cause a lot of tension. But I don't think they will at a certain moment say, oh, wait, this is the end of Schengen, of Dublin, of all we have uh, been talking about. So it will cause tension, but I don't think it will explode. I mean. Otherwise, I think it would already have exploded in the last weeks. The figures for the time being are not very alarming. The EU went through this in the early 90s with Kosovo and uh, Serbia. Uh, almost similar numbers for the time being. My, I think that the issue is complicated compared to what it was in the early 90s. Uh, by the various genies which came out of the bottle in the Middle East and they're not coming back. Uh, we spoke about Syria. But Syria and Iraq are less than 25% in terms of those who seek asylum in Europe. There are 10% to 15% to who come from Afghanistan, Pakistan, and that region. Uh, and they will continue to, uh, to come. Uh, the refugees, and it was mentioned before uh, the previous sessions, that uh, those refugees who went to Jordan, more than one and a half, those who went to Turkey, two and a half million, those who went to Lebanon, 1.1, they are not going to stay there forever. Basically because the countries cannot absorb them. Jordan, at an addition of over four years of 25% of its previous population. Where are they going to find jobs? How are they going to finance education and, and other services in the long run, not tomorrow morning? Number one. Number two, I looked at the, the very few research which were done on the uh, political, religious views of the Muslim communities in Europe. This is alarming. Uh, they have different views from Christian minorities, much more extreme when it comes to religion and the role of religion. Now, uh, what you need is a serious, serious investment in education uh, long term. I don't see the European Union as a union really investing in this. For the time being, it's an individual member's responsibility to deal, to deal with this responsibility and with this task. And some of them are more successful than the others. But in the long run, there is this double danger of continuous migration Call it migration, call it uh, asylum seeking, it, it doesn't really matter because eventually on the budget it's the same burden. And, and, and the long term implications of those who come, by the way, there's also a poss possible potential security problem. I, I, I don't believe that Daesh 
did not throw into these uh, uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, some agents provocateurs. I, I think uh, they would be stupid not to do this from their point of view. And so, uh, is, go is Europe going to crumble? I don't think so, but it will have to face serious tests in the future. If I just may, just, just to react to your last point, I was speaking to school last week, and I got exactly the same question. I mean, how many people from these refugees are from ISIS or terrorists? And you know, if you're ISIS, you have a lot of money, so you can buy a passport, take a plane, and you're just in Brussels like this. You don't have to take the risk to lose your life by taking this boat and crossing all over Europe and maybe not even entering your destination. So I really think that there are no terrorists inside these refugees. That's my opinion. Um, I, 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 my question shifts a bit back to, to where you started the conversation. And one particular element um, struck me. Um, we've talked a lot about, uh, Kurt was talking about the European um, uh, immobility and the joint US, EU, Western, if you want. Um, um, responsibility in, in handling the situation or mishandling the situation. But then um, I also heard uh, the speakers, I mean in particular, but also Ambassador, talking about um, that any potential solution that we can imagine, uh, one, keeps to current borders, and second, implies a certain federalization, so a certain type of, whether you call it communal or, or you know, identity-based or, or sectarian-based, but some kind of new internal arrangement. Now, my question here is, um, is that going to be supported, one, by the, 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 the factions on the ground, and, and under what terms, and second, is that going to be acceptable for the countries in the region? Because it can, in any case, be read either way, so for, um, um, let's call them for the sake of this conversation, Sunni powers in the region, it's going to be re read as, okay, so now Iran has um, a, a significant say both in Baghdad and in this future solution for Syria as it does in Lebanon. Uh, for Sunni countries, it's going to be, or for, from Iran, it's going to be perceived as, oh, but in fact you have, um, a new set of division of labor which makes impossible a, any type of, of sort of continuum there, thus lessening the ability of, of uh, 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 Shia Iran to, to have a, a significant say there. Uh, and that in fact this only serves the interest of outsiders, be it Turkey for the reasons that were mentioned there, or Russia for reasons that again were mentioned there, um, to some degree also to, to Europe because that's going to lessen the pressure on immigration or keep it on, on, under certain type of control, making it tolerable if not, um, if not completely under, under lead. Um, and in that sense, what Amin said about uh, Lebanon, um, it took 20 years almost. Uh, we have now five years of Syria um, and, and we thought Lebanon was bad. Uh, Syria compared to that is even worse and the risks if you if you think about the context just to throw one uh, Literally one grain of sand in the in, in the dynamic. Uh, I think about a couple of weeks ago uh, There was an FBI sting operation in Republic of Moldova successfully cooperating with Moldovan authorities and uh, uh, a bunch of people were arrested trying to sell um, uh, Nuclear uh, radioactive material to somebody who was not a terrorist or terrorist group, but essentially teaching them how to, to, to give it further down, making quite a hefty um, a gain, organized crime, to potentially um, ISIS, ISIL, whatever. But then again, uh, would al-Nusra refuse a, a gift of this sort? My, my short answer to that is Lebanon was containable. Syria may be go out of hand, and that's the biggest issue security-wise. Lebanon has, you know, yes, people were upset because Lebanon was being destroyed. For Israel, it was an issue because, you know, they were being, once in a while, Hezbollah was coming in, and it drew eventually the Israelis. But still, it was regional. And the issue is, if you can mitigate and contain 
a solution, which is what today a lot of people are hoping in Syria. Iraq has done that, where you contain the problem within. And I speak here very much as a real politic and not on a humanitarian grounds. Uh, no. But Syria right now has shown for a refugee crisis, for bringing in the major powers in the region and extra regional powers, that it may not be containable. And I think that's the difference. And I agree with you. I don't think it's sectarian. I even say the Iran actually portrays it as terrorism. But the fact that they're using sectarianism makes it much harder to get out of it. Because if it's a political solution, a conference can create it. But once you raise the anti, you bring in religion into it, and it becomes harder to get the, you know, the protagonist out of the field because then the hatred goes up. I, I believe it's all about power and everybody wants to put it, but the fact that it's projected, it is mostly from the Sunni side. From the Sunni side, the rhetoric is so horrendously sectarian, basically calling anybody who's Shia a non-Muslim. And, and with that, one last thing, which, I, which it also includes the issue of refugees. Again, you're looking as a two-time refugee. I think the problem within the whole issue of Islamic world, and I'm not talking about Indonesia here, I'm talking about the core Middle East Islamic world, is that there is a, there's a nascent debate that is very, very low key right now, but it's mostly been hijacked by people like Daesh or Hezbollah, and when the debate is that, you do not have that freedom in the public space of discussing religion, because you can lose your head, and when they come to Europe also, that is not acceptable. I'm not talking about terrorism. I'm talking about this whole idea of liberal democracy, which this continent and the country I come from now is based on, is being rejected. Not because of colonialism, because the ideas of their system is being debated. I mean, if you look at the Islamist debates, there is a debate going on. Number one is who is a Muslim. Without a question, is who is a Muslim? Personal rights. And this creates a problem where I think we in Europe, United States, have to look at as a long term, again, what, how to mitigate, because we don't want people being blown up, but at the same time, how to deal with it, which brings me my last point, if I may, on democracy. Look, the United States, for better or worse, tried democracy under Bush, democracy by force, the freedom, freedom agenda, the whole Iraq idea was you make Iraq a democracy. I, I will tell you that officially. It was one of the greatest mistakes in our policy. However, it was done with a very, very specific idea. Had it worked, the idea was you decapitate an Arab state which is rich, potentially, which can change OPEC, which has Christians, which has multi, you know, Shia, Sunnis, you, and it has a, a very good basic institutions. You decapitate the state. You put a democratic state, a Frankenstein, and you have a democ democ democracy train. It may sound very crazy, but that was the idea. Then democracy was done in the sense of the Tahrir Square US staying back. Look, I'm not against democracy. This is the only gift we have. That gift is right now being misused. The problem with democracy is liberal democracy is more than elections. Right now, if you look at that part of the world, elections almost in any country. Tunisia may be one case, and I hope we all can help Tunisia. But if you look at most of these countries, who has been elected? Israelis were against Hamas going on election, but we forced it on them. Well, look who won. In Egypt, Egypt has had one election in 5,000 years. Who won? The guy who won right now is in jail, for better or worse. I don't think it's good for democracy. And this is the problem that right now, the whole, the biggest idea, I told you that the paradigm of state and what we believe in is being challenged and we have no answers to it. It's much deeper. And even I include Russia. I don't think Russia is a democracy, I'm just saying, at all. But if you had an election in Russia today, he may not win the 87% he polls, but Mr. Putin will win at least 60% or plus. So you legitimize a autocracy by democracy. And I think it was mentioned in this very stage that there is a new mindset. Putin is one of the most favorite people in the Middle East right now. There are t-shirts of him. He's killing the same Arab, but he's praised. If it's done by the French, American, whatever, it is always bad. Think about that. In East what? Jerusalem, it's Erdogan. Um, I think the real danger is that we get in a scenario in the Middle East 
like we had in our both world wars. The world wars were basically European civil wars where the rest of the world was involved. There were also civil wars, I mean, in the end. And uh, which ended, let's say, the end of uh, multicultural states into small mono-ethnic states. I mean, that's the same what we have tried to do, by the way, in uh, ex-Yugoslavia. So, I really do not, I mean, if this rhythm goes on, I mean, I do not exclude that we really get into a real big mess everywhere. And uh, for example, you can see that, for example, Jordan is trying everything to keep all everything out, but it's very easy to, I mean, to that Jordan is getting involved, uh, and so forth and so forth. I mean, it can be a domino effect that is going to be terrible, really terrible, and uh, where we will end up in a kind of fragmented, many monocultural, mono-religious, uh, smaller country. I mean, Iraqi Kurdistan is like an evidence. I mean, they can become independent like this. They have the royal, they, can, they sell the royal. I mean, it's very easy. Um, and, 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 and there are several parts that can be divided up. I mean, I hope I will not see this, but I think, I think that the, the, the possibility of going into a real, real regional war is today very, very high. The truth is that uh, when you look at all the seven states that I mentioned earlier, I doubt that you can bring the genie back into the bottle. First of all, the bottle is broken. Uh, and secondly, uh, the people the genies, if you want, they don't want to go back to it. So what, you're going to force a central regime in Libya? How are you going to do this? Uh, can you force a central regime in Baghdad? No, you will need the tacit understanding and maybe a written understanding of all the local players and the external players. Complicated? Absolutely. What is the alternative? A continued war, uh, internal war with uh, external participants uh, like in Syria? That's the alternative. Uh, and so, basically, if you want to prevent another Cold War, uh, Cold war uh, between external players, if you want to prevent migration, uh, call it whatever you want, uh, asylum seekers or uh, political, uh, whatever you want to call them, they are coming into your houses. And so if you want to prevent this, you want to prevent uh, uh, an international conflict, if you want to prevent bloodshed, if you want to prevent the collapse of Jordan, uh, which will be, uh, if, if you think that Syria is bad, in Syria, for example, Israel stayed away. If, if something you know, on this uh, line happens in Jordan, can we then stay away and say, well, you know, God bless you, we we'll continue to fight each other? We, we just could. We will be sucked in. Saudi Arabia will be sucked in. And so uh, Syria is relatively simple, quote unquote. And so what is the alternative? No, it's not a good solution to Jordan, what I suggested, the Iraqi model or the Swiss model or whatever you want to call it. And so you don't have to apply it as long as there is no problem. And I don't think there will be a similar problem in Jordan or in Egypt. Egypt is a monolithic, uh, from the demographic point of view, it's a monolithic uh, state, homogeneous. Uh, yes, they have a problem between, a serious problem between uh, a well-entrenched political party called the Muslim Brothers, and the regime, the previous regime, Mubarak regime, committed serious mistakes, and the international community stayed away, allowed them to commit the mistake, and then they throw him away in two seconds. But these are, this is the past. Now you have to look into the future. And in, in the future, you will have to accept not the most optimal solution, you will have to accept something with which every participant can live. Now, is it the best solution for the regional participant? No, it's not. But what is the alternative? What is the alternative for Israel? What is the alternative for Iran? What is the alternative for Turkey? Yes, Turkey doesn't want to see an independent uh, uh, 
a third estate. But they live now for several years with an independent, uh, again, everything but by name, uh, and the KLG. They have commercial relations and they live with it because what is the alternative? Now, uh, if the Kurds go beyond their political uh, uh, capabilities and establish a, or try to establish a Syrian Kurdish and a, 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 a in conjunction or separately from the Iraqi one, that will be a serious mistake, a Kurdish mistake, and we'll have to deal with it, hopefully not. But these are the, these are the possibilities, this is the range of solutions, so, and it does not include the, re, the return of central strong governments in Baghdad, in Damascus, in Tripoli, I don't see how it happens, so, we go for the second bit. Who on earth is going to do that for Syria? By the, the way, U.S. did it in Iraq. Uh, in Iraq. Uh, you're right. By the way, the Lebanese model works against me, against my argument, because you have there a sort of uh, a coalition, supposedly a coalition, which supposedly runs the country. Unfortunately, it is not very well run, and they, they have a government in name, but not, uh, not in practice. The government fails to, to deal with the serious problem and fails to act. Now, I, we can go into this, and uh, it, it, it needs really a long, uh, longer session. But the fact is, Lebanon holds together, somebody cleans the garbage, schools are open, uh, the economy, not the most successful in the world, but it functions. And so, once again, offer me the alternative so I can consider what is better. There's nothing better than that. Unfortunately, we have to live with the Middle East as it is, as it was in the past. It was held uh, successfully, less successfully by the Ottoman Empire, by the British Empire, by the French Empire, they are gone. So what you have to do now is live with the consequences. I'm not sure how representative this is, but I've seen one polling on what Syrians actually think um, about their future and whether they want to live in a state that's falling um, into three or four different parts. And the majority, which means it's more than 60%, say that they definitely want to stay in a united country. Um, which is just, you know, we are uh, all talking global politics, but it's just not, um, let's just not forget the people. A uh, question for Amin. Uh, in one sentence, you just nailed the issue that we are really trying to understand. Legitimizing autocracy to democracy. Uh, what do we do? Because if you look around the world, the, the, the concept has been abused and used in many ways over and over. Uh, what do you do in Syria? Last year, uh, the, the department I ran, we ran a whole series of monthly conferences on democratization in the Arab world. We went country by country, and then uh, two months ago, we had a, a conference uh, looking at, and we included Afghanistan because the U.S. was involved there, Iraq, Yemen, and so on and so forth. And the cases, and we didn't do Tunisia because that's kind of out of the sphere where I, I deal with. I stop, my, my work stops on Egypt to the West. And case by case, unfortunately, and we had people from, in, from these countries coming in, the prognosis was, was, was democracy in the sense we know is, is, is not taking root because right now they, 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 they ch cherry pick parts of democracy, as I said, Partially, for example, the aspect of election, which legitimizes an undemocratic system. This is, a, again, I have to go back to the Greek playwrights of Sophocles and Euripides. You know, always, you know, you had the Greek uh, heroine or hero, and always they had a, two choices, none of which were good. For the West, for the United States, for, for Europe, which democracy always has been, if you, if you would, our best gift, our best hope. What made these countries what we are today is being abused 
And if we sell it, which the United States did, better or worse, President Obama did it hands off, that was criticized, didn't work. President Bush did it by force, that didn't work. Always say, no, if you do it another way. I don't think there's any way which we do it unless the societies themselves go through, the, through a, a reassessment of their own self. And I think it begins with certain rights. I think, number one, the right of, as I said, assembly and freedom of religion is essential. Europe fought for years. When I was born, Prague, I mean, you know the history, what happened there. And until that, I, don't, I hope they don't go through the European model because it took 450 years. But you have to come to this idea of allowing the other to think differently and the weak to have a right to petition into a court. These are the basics. I don't think it's about, about elections, but we take the easy part. The state building we did, all of us in that part of the world, looked at the elections and the institutions of a democracy rather than the underlying, which takes a long time. As I said one thing, it doesn't fit our system today. Why? Because we have elections. We want results yesterday. We, we cannot wait generations. It's just our political systems, whether it's European parliamentary system or our more presidential systems, they are very short term. This is a very long term project and I really don't see a solution to it. And I think this is where Putin becomes, unfortunately his message resonates much better than our message ever does. Thank you. And that's, 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 that's I think an undertaking that we have to talk about and I'm glad, why am I here? Because I like to talk about it within this kind of a forum. I don't have an answer. I wish I did. Thank you. Well, th this is somehow echoes the, the, the motto of the, of the session, a wake-up call that President John was mentioning at the beginning. Because that's an issue that, it's an issue, and we have to convey it to society. But how? So. What we indeed have to realize is that, I mean, the crisis we had in the, the, the 18th century, intellectual crisis, uh, I mean, that this is exactly the crisis where, uh, uh, where the Arab world is in right now, I mean, and, and the Islam is right in. I mean, real liberalism, I mean, died uh, 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 thanks to the British uh, in Egypt. Um, and then Nasser tried, I mean, pan-Arabism and socialism, it died in, in 67 after the massive defeat against Israel in just six days. Then came Islamism, and uh, it was going up, up, up. I mean, thanks to uh, Saudi Arabia, but they have seen the Muslim Brotherhood, and now they see uh, they see uh, Islamic State, and suddenly people also say, "Yeah, but that's, that's also not what we want." So basically, right now, all recipes for let's say the state and how to combine state with religion has lost, and so they are in a deep intellectual crisis, and nobody has an answer. Some still go back, and others say, yeah, but Europe is the answer, or they say, Putin is the answer, but basically, they don't know anymore. And the problem is that, of course, I mean, this intellectual crisis is now coinciding with <laughs> a dramatic uh, military, well, uh, 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 down spiraling, but the problem is we cannot solve it for them. So they will have to do it, and they're starting with it, and it took us an awful lot of time to, to get out of this problem, and I'm afraid they will have this time, they will need this time as well. And we should give it to them. And it's, uh, yeah, well, well, let's hope it's go faster now. How the European Union would uh, behave uh, seeing such a long-standing conflict in, the, in this near neighborhood, which has such concrete implications of everyday European life by the migration crisis. And um, everyone is asking for European leadership in these days, which it's easy to agree with. But uh, the, the situation is unfortunately much more complicated. And Europe is more complicated. And, and my question would, would go, what do you think about this, this European leadership question? I would think that uh, the leadership is, uh, is, is a complicated process because what I think we would need is a re, uh, re 
focus of European security policy or recomposition of European security policy, which I don't think exists at the moment, a one which most of the 28 countries would agree. Uh, this is more acute now with the Middle East crisis than with the Ukraine because that was too far for many of the European Union countries. This one is now very real in most of the countries. Uh, if everyone is asking for re uh, leadership, then we usually think leader is one person, is a strong person, and then we very easily get a strong populist who is very easily telling you the answer, like Viktor Orban in Hungary who said, close the border of Europe and then everything is solved, which is obviously not the case. So I wonder what you think of what, what the European leadership is about in, in this case. Uh, I am dealing now for years with this question uh, because uh, I negotiated Israel's agreement with the EU, the ambassador to the EU, and I continue to follow this. The question of leadership is important, but I think it's not only that. It is vision, which I think is missing. Uh, if you have vision, then you need leaders to, to follow this vision, but there is no vision. Uh, or there are conflicting visions about Europe uh, among those in uh, Britain and elsewhere who want to basically split the EU, weaken the EU or whatever, those who continue to believe in the Schumann idea and uh, those who looked at uh, Europe as it should, at least in my view, uh, be. The problem of vision uh, is the missing vision is also true about the Middle East. When all of these countries, including the host country today, uh, emerged from the Soviet uh, yoke, uh, the Soviet control, Europe understood, had a vision of what to do with all these countries. And the fact is that to, today you are members. Now, when I uh, project this situation to the Middle East, I understand. And I'm glad you brought the issue of Tunisia because this is the best example I can give. Tunisia it will not be a member of the EU, nor will Morocco be, or Turkey, or Israel for that matter. Uh, for whatever reason. And I'm not uh, one which says that there is a racial a uh, reason for all these countries not being members of the EU. And there is a limit to the capacity of the EU to, uh, to take Tunisia into a much larger country like Morocco or Egypt or Turkey for that matter. But what happens is that the EU doesn't want the tomatoes from Tunisia. I, 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 I make it a primitive argument, but there it is. You basically don't want the tomatoes, and you don't want the to those who grow the tomatoes coming to Europe. You have to make a choice, number one. Number two, what do you want in the neighborhood? You want to influence the neighboring countries to apply, to adopt the standards, the ethics, the system, in their country, so you increase the security of Europe because the neighborhood will behave up to a standard point. But you don't want them to become members in the shaping of the decision. The EU created a mechanism, the Barcelona process, the Mediterranean Union, also to distance the, the neighboring countries, not to bring them closer. All of these mechanisms are established to create a gap, a distance between Europe and the neighborhood. Take the Tunisian agricultural minister today and tell him you can come to the meetings of the Council on Agriculture. You don't vote. When we take decisions, you don't vote. But you can express your view, your country's view. You help to shape the decision. This is how you make them. I, I we reckon, don't have this vision. I reckon Western Balkans uh, agricultural mis ministers will react on this uh, fairly quickly. Um, Kurt. 
No, I, I think the lack of leadership in Europe is, uh, well, sometimes you would say, I mean, European leadership, question mark, that would be a great idea. Um, I think the problem is that Europe is facing its own identity crisis. Um, Europe had uh, the enlargement, I mean, basically, everybody was supporting the enlargement until it happened. And for many people, suddenly, populism came up, like it was already mentioned. So people suddenly felt like insecure. They then voted against the European Constitution in France and the Netherlands, which was again like, oh, what's the next step? We had just voted in the, 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 the successor of the, of the European Constitution was the Lisbon of Treaty, uh, the Treaty of Lisbon, when the financial and economic crisis happened, and every, and then the finan financial was not solved yet. Of Uc or Ukraine happened. The thing is that European construction is, in fact, not made to solve crises. And we have many crises in a short time, and nobody knows what to do anymore. And during all this turbulence, let's say, inside the Union, we get this massive Arab revolution. And we just, our own furniture was not in place yet, and suddenly, this happened. We were not ready. I mean, I truly regret that, and I have tried everything to, to turn this around on my own individual way, which, of course, uh, leads to nothing. But, um, I mean, we are not ready. And the problem is that nowadays the challenges are, like, too big, and, 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 and we can't deal with them anymore. So I, I'm also afraid that the, uh, the leadership lack of leadership is also based on an, a kind of own identity crisis that we need to solve pretty soon in order to, 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 to deal with new crises. I would say very few things in this because I don't want to tread into a place that I don't want to tread. So I wear my European birth and say it not from where I work but as somebody at least was born in this continent. Look, I will leave the leadership on this Arab issue right now. We t heard it. Let's talk about the, the defense side of it, whether it's Ukraine or if you want to, you said no-fly zone or whatever. In the military sense, I think Europe as a whole, I mean, remember there was something called Euroforce? One of the major countries has actually pulled all those troops out of that, so it's just by name. When you, when you look at an alliance, there's something about the, the defense of it. There's NATO, of course, all members of EU are not members of NATO, but even within NATO, there is a, you cannot have leadership, I hate to say this, when you don't put the bill and we don't build up. And even an agreement, a consistent agreement has not been met by the vast majority of the members. So we cannot exert, not that exert force, but you cannot even exert yourself politically when you don't have the backing. You know, calling a no-fly zone is easy. And I, you know, I hear I, I, Libya is a case where I think one reason U.S. would we didn't go to Syria was the Libya backlash. Libya was started mainly by the Arabs, supported by two major European countries. They are out of ammunition. I'm not giving you something that you don't know. I mean, you don't think Putin knows that? When you run out of ammunition in a, in a, in a, in a, a, a small theater of Libya, or cannot bring in people, that shows a great lack of resources put into this defensive, and I call it leadership because this is the region here, and now with Russia's system again coming up, I think it's testing that issue. So it has to go back, and I'm not a European citizen because I work with the government. I could become one day. So you have to, you have to deal with me. For your pension. Yeah. <laughs> I take all the EU pension, the Czech pension. But, uh, but you know, the, the thing is that, that I think you have to look at it. On, I think Europe had a dance. From 89, a dance started and it went to almost a, a, a euphoric dance. I think that stopped. Where you can put the money as governments, where you put the priorities has to shift. And again, leadership is here is how, how to take those decisions. Because again, and I'll stop here because you have, uh, Europe is also made up of some larger countries and that, that, that I stopped. But I think on the security aspect, I can say that Euroforce didn't work, clearly. And in NATO, there's, I hate to say it, but it's a it's, it's very dismal record for, by some major states of not stepping in. 
If you don't step in, you can't expect always something to happen militarily, or at least as a security aspect, when you don't step into the plate. Just, so I, I don't want to say more because I may step on some landmines. So. Thank you very much. I also think that we need to finish before we turn the word democracy into an unword or do uh, any other uh, additional damage. I thank you so much for uh, bearing with, uh, with me and with our guests for uh, this one and a half hours. And join me in thanking the panelists uh, for this great discussion. Thank you so much. <laughs>